Well, thanks for being here, everybody. So uh, this is part of what we call the uh, open source on-ramp. So this is a group of talk meant for people who are new to the topic. Uh, so in this case, the topic will be getting started with Kubernetes. We have two great speakers to get you started with that. Uh, uh, Mason, who is from Gretel, and Kim, who is from DigitalOcean. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to them. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good, my mic's working, yay. Well, welcome everyone, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Mason, I'm the lead developer advocate at Gretel.ai. And I'm Kim Schlesinger, I'm a cloud native developer advocate at DigitalOcean. And before Mason was at Gretel, he was a developer advocate at DigitalOcean, which is why we're giving this talk together, we used to be colleagues. Yes, <laughs> yes, a lot of fun old times. <laughs> but now, this time today, we're gonna talk about getting started with uh, Kubernetes. So we're gonna move, the first thing we're gonna do is do just a brief introduction of the application and what we're doing um, and verification of, the, of your environment. So just show of hands, how many people are actively gonna be participating, following along, executing the code with us? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to come around for the first 10, 15 minutes and see, uh, make sure that, you're, if, that those that wanna participate have a functioning environment because you need to have a couple things installed. We'll help you get them installed if you don't. If you're not already connected to the, the conference Wi-Fi, um, go ahead and do that. And then after that, we're gonna talk really quickly about a one-time secret app that I've already deployed and we're just gonna have you build inside of Docker. Uh, if we had more time, we'd have you build it, but I don't have the time to dive deep into cryptography today. And also it's four o'clock, I don't have the brain power to dive <laughs> deep, deep into cryptography today. Um, we're gonna build that application as a Flask application and you have the option to upload it to Docker. I already have it in Docker Hub because if you wanna fight conference Wi-Fi while trying to upload to Docker Hub, <laughs> you know, the saints be with you, but it's not gonna be fun. Um, I had to install Homebrew earlier on my laptop on conference Wi-Fi and that took about 30 minutes. So good luck. Um, then I'm gonna, we're gonna turn it over to Kim and Kim is gonna walk you through all the magical Kubernetes stuff of spinning up a cluster, deploying the application, configuring your application to be highly available. And then we have a quiz at the very end where we have some wonderful swag that we're gonna give away. There's also swag on the back chair in the back corner that you can take with you. Uh, yes, so first thing we're gonna do is um, verification environment. So if every, everyone who is doing this or anyone who wants to take a picture, this code is the workshop like this is where all of the source code is. So every, you, can, you could do this entire workshop without me or Kim if you go to this page. It's wonderful. And then we do wanna say hi to those of us who are joining virtually. We're happy to have you here. And so during this uh, verification time, Mason and I will be available to help. Also Otto, who's in the audience, can you, can you wave? Um, so Otto will also be able to help and when it comes time to apply DigitalOcean credits, um, Otto will be the person that you wanna talk to. If you're watching online uh, and you're on the virtual platform, if you send a direct message to Otto uh, and tell him the email address you use for your DigitalOcean account, he can apply the credits that way. And uh, if for some reason you can't get those credits applied right now, um, I have some information in the repo where you can email me after and I'll apply the credits after the fact. Uh, DigitalOcean does billing monthly, so you won't be charged uh, right away for that. So. Yes, and if you are gonna participate, you do need a digital, your, unless you plan on spinning up your own Kubernetes cluster on your own local environment, you will need a, uh, you will need a DigitalOcean account. Um, we're gonna be spinning this up through the DigitalOcean Kubernetes service. It's just an easy way to get a really vanilla Kubernetes cluster running. Yep. I'm gonna pass it off to Mason. Okay, <laughs> well the only thing we have to do now is we have to get our environments set up. So in reality, if you have uh, Docker installed and you're participating, you're good because we're gonna do everything in Docker, like we're not gonna execute anything lo uh, locally. Um, so Python 3.7, the Docker image will take care of that. Also a good tool to have would be ha to some sort of tool that you can submit post requests uh, with JSON as the payload through. So if you want to do this with curl, 100% you can do it with curl. I like HTTP IE. Um, if you've never seen it, you should definitely check it out. Um, it's a very straightforward, uh, basically like, kind of like curl, but it lets you do stuff like this, which I will zoom in if I can, where instead of having to actually like write the JSON and such or anything with the tokens, you can just set key value pairs and it will translate it for you. So this is a great tool for testing or if you have something like Postman or anything like that, um, that will be more than enough to get, get us through it. 
Um, you'll need a DigitalOcean account. And if you want to upload your own Docker image and deploy it to Kubernetes today, you can. We also will have the exact same Docker image already uploaded on my Docker Hub, so you don't have to fight conference Wi-Fi trying to upload a Docker image. So of those of you who are participating, who does not have a functioning environment where Docker is working? You. OK, so we're, Kim and I are going to split up, and we're going to help the people that need that. For those of you that are here, um, I don't know, you can dance, or <laughs> you can. Uh, this, is, this is an interactive workshop, so we're going to try to get these people set up as quickly as possible, um, and then we'll be back to it. Uh, you can cut our mics. We'll come back when, I'll let you know when it's time to turn them back on.
Citation account or you've had one in the past and you need credits, Otto is the person to uh, take care of that. Uh, he has to manually enter your email address uh, to apply those credits. So, um, yeah, uh, why don't you go to him? <laughs>
Okay. Okay, I think we have everyone good. So, moving forward, we'll go ahead and give everyone like a minute to get back to their place and stuff, it's fine. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, okay, so, just quick poll of the audience. How many people have built a Docker container before, any sort of container before? Okay, good, that's a great number. Um, how many people have deployed something to Kubernetes before? Okay, great number. Any other questions you want me to ask? That's all. We're good? Okay, so, and I actually forgot one on my list here. You need to have kubectl inst installed, but we'll get to that later. It's relatively easy to install. So the next thing we're gonna do, and the, the whole part that I'm going to do right now is we're gonna talk about a one-time secret app that in a longer workshop, we would have had time to build from scratch, but today I'm just gonna show you the source code. We're gonna kind of walk through what it does, the architecture of it, and then we're gonna go for, and then you can use the, the Docker container that we provide, or you can build one yourself. Okay, so who here is familiar with the concept of a one-time secret app, or knows what, what that is? Has anyone ever used onetimesecret.com, or something like that? Okay, so a one-time secret application is actually a really useful tool for most, uh, most, com most companies. Say you, say you are working in an IT department and you need to be able to give someone like a new password, but we're all remote now. We don't really have a great way of just you know, delivering these and sending it over Slack or something isn't the best thing to do. So what we can do is we can create a secret here so we can just say, hello, OSS Summit, or something like that. Um, and then we can create a passphrase. We'll just say, I don't know, cheese. That'll be my passphrase. And what we do is we create this secret link. And then what I can do is I can send them this one time, this link, which has a you know, unique ID at the end and basically has a secret, and it will be you know, secret for seven days or however long we have it. So we open this up, we paste it. It's gonna ask us for the password. This is something that I could call someone over and be like, hey, the password is cheese, or I guess you could send that to them on Slack. It kind of defeats the purpose, but at least it's not credentials in the wild. This, is, this secret is only valid once. So now, if I type the word cheese, I can see the message. And now the message can never be viewed again. That link is a dead link. It's never coming back. The password is gone. And this is just a great way to be able to set stuff up, um, to be able to send people privileged information that you don't want to send in plain text, uh, but you also don't want them to, to be able to linger somewhere on the internet forever. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to wonder why that went away, is we're going to build a, um, we're gonna build a REST API for this. So I'm not a front end developer, you don't get fancy JavaScript with Mason. You get Python APIs and the command line as it should be. Um, and if you disagree, we can talk about it later, I'm joking. But if you would like to see the code, all of the code is at this website, grtl.ai slash oss2022-k8-workshop. Um, it's also in the do-community org. You'll find it as soon as you look for it on GitHub but essentially that's just a short link to it and it's in the Python directory. So if I've, already, if I've, if I've helped you set up, you already have it set up, um, but you basically you need to be able to download that code and run it. So let's look at that code before we move forward. So we have a Python directory and we're gonna make that a little bit bigger because that's really difficult to read. Okay, are we gonna be really fancy and hit the dot and open up the web editor? Let's see if it works. Again, conference Wi-Fi. Always fun to test conference Wi-Fi live during presentations. So, Python. Okay, so we have the application. So for, actually first, let's talk about just the endpoints of this application. So this application is extremely simple. Um, open preview. We went all the way around to just open the preview, something that we could have read in Markdown on the thing. So, here we go. We've come full circle. So this API will have two, two, two endpoints, post and, or both of them are post, one is secrets, and then that doesn't even show up, or I forgot to put it there, and then one is secrets with an ID. So when you post a value to the secrets endpoint without an ID at the end, so localhost 8080 slash secrets, you'll supply it with a message, a passphrase, and then an optional expiration time. Okay, this expiration time is what we saw, you know, I want this password to, to I want this to expire in seven days, we don't wanna keep this around forever. So when we post this in, it will take it, encrypt the, encrypt the message with the passphrase, and then return to you a unique ID, which we'll use in the decrypt process, which is the post secrets down here, where you will do secret slash that ID, and then provide it the passphrase, and you get, you get it back. Is it 
Everyone got everyone good? We got thumbs up if we're good, thumbs down if we're not, we good? Fantastic, okay. Um, it's really not that complicated of an app, but it can get kind of messy really quick. Um, luckily, I actually abstracted out all of the cryptography stuff because I did not want to have to talk about that in public. I don't think I could, it's beyond my beyond what I can do. Okay, are we gonna scroll today? We're not gonna scroll today. Okay, so what we're gonna do is this, this, this is a great um, opportunity for us to use a database like Redis. So for those of you that don't know, Redis is a key value store database, um, basically like a, somewhat of a NoSQL, I think it is a NoSQL database. I'm not a database person. If I say things that are false about databases, please don't flog me. Um, I, I work in networks and DevOps, I don't like databases. But I do like Redis, because Redis is easy. It's key value store, so we're basically gonna have the password and we're going to have the, the message and the password. And what we're going to do is we're going to encrypt the password, the, the message with the passphrase. And then we're going to take the SHA of the password and keep that. And that's what we're going to use as our lookup identifier. So the key. Here's what I found. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I, I move my wrist like this and it bumps the, the crown and it talks. So anyway, we're gonna take the SHA of the password, that will be our lookup key. So whenever someone submits something, we're gonna look it up based on that, on that lookup. We're gonna take that password SHA, and if we find something, hey, that someone was potentially using the right link with the right password, we're good. Um, and then we're going to decrypt it. And then the other thing that we can do is with the, the scroll is just not gonna to work today. What we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the fact that Redis has um, the ability to expire, expire things in the database on its own using set EX. So instead of us having to implement this whole time check system to see is this valid or is this not, we're just gonna let the database do it. That's called not doing work you don't need to do because somebody else already did it and they probably did it better than you did. So never re-implement sorts in the standard API or in the standard library. Whenever I speak at colleges, I tell them that all the time. Yes, we know your data structure professor made you implement bubble sort. You are never going to implement bubble sort in your life. And if you do, you should reevaluate your life choices. So, okay, so basically what we're gonna do is just a little bit of boilerplate. As you can see, I committed with my debug statements here because I was having problems. Um, we're gonna validate to make sure that the message and the passphrase are in the, in the data. Um, if the expiration time is set, then what we're going to do is we're going to take it. The expiration time is expressed here in seconds. Um, if the expiration time is not set, we're going to set it to 604,800, which I believe is a week um, in seconds. Don't quote me on that. We're going to create a unique ID. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger too because I still can't read it. Um, and that needs to go away. Yes, that makes life a whole lot easier. I still wish you would scroll the way I wanted you to, but we can't have everything, can we? So we're gonna create a unique ID. So whenever you create the password, whenever you create this, send this password in to be created, it's gonna be a unique ID so someone can access it. We're going to um, use a library that I wrote to basically, um, oh no, this is where we're gonna, to get the SHA of the password, of the passphrase, because that's what's gonna be our key in Redis. Then we're gonna use the same library to encrypt the message with the passphrase. We're gonna set, you're gonna do redis.setex, which will set the SHA password the encrypted text, the cipher text, and then it will set a default, uh, it'll either set the default expiration time or it will set an expiration time that you have chosen. So we're gonna do that, do a set EX, and then we're gonna return true and the ID. The ID is what's gonna be used in the decryption process because you're gonna go to slash secret slash ID to access the unique data at that ID. Have I lost anybody or everybody? Is there anybody still with me? Any questions about, about just the architecture of the application? This is one of my favorite applications. It's more fun. So many people do like, oh, we're all gonna make Wordle now. I'm like, no, I'm gonna make a one-time secret. I don't wanna make Wordle. <laughs> like, I already don't get the Wordles right as it is. Why would I wanna make another app that I can't win at? These are the jokes. If you don't laugh, it's gonna be a long presentation. <laughs> okay, so this, the decryption process is basically the same, but in reverse. Um, we're gonna take the ID and we're gonna take the passphrase. Then what we do is we, de we, um, we will take the passphrase, we'll get the data, out of, what did I do here? We'll get the, okay, so what we did is we stored the SHA also in the data. We'll get the data out, we'll compare the SHAs to make sure that they're the same. When the SHAs, if the SHAs are the same, that means, hey, you actually have stumbled, you have stumbled across a password that is the valid, like, this is real, you're not just, you know, banging up against the door seeing whoever's gonna let you in. Um, we will delete, the, delete it from the database. And it's actually pretty funny because this is probably a weird part of the application because we delete it before we even, 
like re return it back. So basically someone tried to get it. If, if, if line 92 fails, it deletes the app and they don't get it. But we'll just, we'll call that, eh. we'll call it a demo app, not ready for prod. Um, so we take the SHA, we get it. If it's the same, we use that same password. We use the password they provided to decrypt it and then we return back the plain text. Pretty straightforward, right? Any questions before I move on? And we'll, I'm gonna demo like this in action. Like I know I'm talking and like waving my hands. Um, you're gonna see how it actually works. Now the question is how do I get out of this and go back to the GitHub view? Because I don't use the VS code. Oh, back, the back button will work. No, it didn't. Is it dot dot? Oh, I was, that would have made sense. It would have got me. Like, I don't want the editor anymore. There we go. Okay. The other things that we have in here are a G unicorn config. And this is an interesting um, discussion when you deploy Python applications. Um, a lot of people may be tempted, you may be tempted to use like Flask run when you're running a Python application inside of a container. That's still not secure. Um, and it's like not in any way thread safe. So like don't do it. Like you should still, even if you're running in a container, I know most of us got away from using WSGIs and stuff because it wasn't, wasn't the easiest time to deploy Python. Don't use Flask run, still set up a G unicorn, set up multiple workers. That way you can at least do something in parallel. I mean, like right now our Docker containers are only gonna have one core. Like we're, only, we're gonna be running them on one core droplets. But if you're running them on multi-core droplets, we would wanna take advantage of that. And even still, even if you're running it on a one core droplet, you can still run two, maybe even four node workers without worrying about the, you know, the core because you're, you know, they're all gonna be doing their own thing in, uh, in parallel. So it's not that big of an issue. Processes were made to, made to multi-process. The, the TLDR of that statement was don't use Flask run in Docker. Use G-Unicorn, maybe use Mod Whiskey. Uh, I wouldn't. Even if you have Apache Inferno? Even if you have what? Apache Inferno. Yeah, uh, well, so are you running Apache in the same container as the application? Or are you running, are you running like in it? Okay, if you're doing it in, inside of the same container as the application, then however you use Apache and WSGI to get it. But most people run Docker containers and they run like an Nginx proxy above it and then they, they route it through, but they're still running the Flask run. And like, I haven't, I don't, I don't know. If, Apache yeah, Apache would be, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I would still run it. I would, st I actually, I would still, just to be safe, because I don't, the Flask run stuff offers no security whatsoever. Like they say, it, when you run it, do not use this in prod. We can't guarantee this is safe. We can't guarantee that the CSRF is gonna work properly. Like just don't do it. So on a, on a, just a safety note, I would do it, I would do it to be safe. Um, safe, better safe than sorry, to be honest. I will also not claim to be a professional a expert in Python, uh, uh, deployment, but from the people that I've met who uh, write Flask, they definitely say don't ever use uh, the, uh, don't use Flask running prod. Um, I, I, I hang out with them at PyCon every year, so they're pretty cool people. Uh, okay, and then the last thing we have is our Docker file. So what we have here is we have uh, from Python, and I made a mistake, I didn't pin my Python version, I'm gonna cause an outage. Whoever, he who does not pin his prod, does not pin his things, causes outages, or they, they who do not, he or she, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to be. If you don't pin your stuff, you're going to cause an outage. Um, I have lived many a life of an, as an SRE of people who did not pin packages and then wonder why their app didn't work yesterday. So don't do that. Um, we're going to set some environment variables, setting the DB host, the port, the password, and then SSL equals true. If you're running this locally, like if you say you install Redis on your local machine and you are not testing this on like a production grade Redis server, you're going to want to turn that SSL off for the local, local host stuff because it will just sit there and hang because you didn't set up any of the certs or any of that stuff. Um, ask me how I know that as I sit there wondering why my app isn't working for 30 minutes until I realized it's SSL just hanging. Um, do a really quick run, make dir, we're gonna make, make a directory for the application, we're gonna set it as our work, working directory, we're gonna add all of the stuff in our current directory into that application directory, we're gonna pip install our requirements. Um, if you, you can use a virtual environment here if you want, that is one of the biggest debates, is should we use virtual environments in Docker? Docker is already an isolated environment, virtual on virtual seems to me to be overly redundant, you do what you wanna do, I don't, I am on the no, we don't need virtual environments in Docker. Um, some people agree with me, some people throw pitchforks at me. It's whatever you wanna do. You're gonna expose 8080, whatever port you want, but we need to expose the ports for Kubernetes later. And then we're just gonna run the gunicorn command, we're gonna bind it uh, to 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0, which in reality, because we have this in our gunicorn config, we didn't need to do the command line args here, but either way. And then we're gonna run the application. Any questions before I move forward? Fantastic. 
So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to build this application. Also, for those of you that don't know, control L is a shorthand for clear. As I say it, and it doesn't work because it wants to make me a liar right in front of everybody. Thank Can you. you I appreciate that. Increase the size of yeah, I need to increase the size. How do I on I, I term? Will command plus work? Command plus works. Whee! Here we go. Okay, so we need to go into code, do community, OSS, Python. Okay, so we're in Python, we're in the Python directory, and all we're gonna do here is we're just gonna do a Docker build. So if you've never seen Docker build before, um, as I went over the Docker file, but I'll say it again, Docker file is a way of defining your container. So we're, we've defined the container that we need to deploy to, to Kubernetes. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a Docker build and it's going to set all of these things. So Docker build. Now you can be a little bit more like verbose with, with your naming schema here. Like if you are gonna upload this to say a Docker Hub repository, so say like my username is Mason and my Docker Hub repository is OTS, I would wanna do something like Mason slash OTS here. You can also uh, retroactively add tags to an image after the fact so you can push it. We're gonna do neither here, we're just gonna do build OTS I'm gonna say dot for the current directory. So look in the current directory for the Docker file and let's build it. Now I've already built this on my machine because whenever I built it earlier, we are not having a day with the scroll bar. Something is up with this. Oh no, it went away. I think the whole computer just kaboomed. <laughs> Python and Docker, not the greatest. That's a lie. There it goes. Okay, something is really upset with my <laughs> laptop. Come on. This is gonna be fun. Okay. We're gonna pretend like we saw it work and we're not gonna ask too many questions. So, I think that's a, it's a terrible color, but we see enough of it. We see, the five, we see the five layers run. So basically it does the run from the Docker IO Python. So basically pulls down the, pulls down the image from uh, Docker Hub, so the Python image is directly from Docker Hub, Docker Hub. like Docker Hub maintains as what is known as a base set of library images, um, or they help maintainers of those projects maintain it. So whenever Python sets out a new release, Python builds the Docker image, uploads it to Docker Hub, it's part of a, what's called the base library of Docker. Then um, all of those environment variables were set, we run um, the makedir slash app to create it, we've created a directory inside of our Docker file, we add all of the code to the Docker file, we've run pip install, and now it's ready to go. Like, everything's ready. Whenever we execute it, it's gonna run that command and the application is going to run. Now what we have to do, though, is we have to set up our Docker file. Now we have to connect it to a Redis database. So for those of you who are, we are having interesting issues with the laptop today. The trackpad has revolted. Like None of my key swipes are working. Not even clicking. Okay, I know how to do this. You hold the pillow over it until it goes, ah. <laughs> and we do a hard restart, which doesn't even seem to be working. Okay, there we go. Okay, anyway, while we're here, isn't that so tranquil? <clears throat> You're kidding me. Do you wanna use my computer? It's trying to update. <laughs> <laughs> You love me. <laughs> okay, no, we're good, we're good. I was like, I saw the line come across, it's like, you are absolutely kidding me. Like, like, I understand being upset that I've told you no on updating for the last three days, but doing it in the middle of a presentation seems a little bit passive aggressive. Um, I would like to speak to Apple, I would like to speak to the Apple people immediately. So, okay, that's fun, here we go. We get to start it all over, what's up? You are welcome to follow along. I know I go fast. I can go slower if you'd like me to go slower. Um, I'm trying not to take up all of Kim's time. Because the Kubernetes stuff is actually the way more fun stuff. At the end of the day, I have a Docker image ready on Docker Hub that she's gonna use that you're gonna deploy to Kubernetes. This is just me having something to do. <laughs> because Kim does all the important stuff. So let's see if Mac is gonna work again. We're gonna hit plus. Maybe it was the zoom in. Maybe zoom is just too much to render for a Mac. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm being a little bit salty, but I'm thinking, I am like to think it's funny. Okay, so let's go back to the Docker build. Docker build. And now I can't type. Yay! Uh, okay, we have to start Docker. 
Okay, now we wait on that to, to go. I could just do, I can't even do a Docker pull without the Docker daemon running. So I was like, I could just pull it off the, pull it off my repository, but um, okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run, I'm, I'm, my part is almost done. We're gonna run the Docker. I'm going to show you it working. I'm gonna show you like run the post API commands and then Kim is gonna do the Kubernetes part. So if you're here for the Kubernetes part, you had to deal with me for a little bit, I'm sorry, but it's coming up soon. As soon as the Docker daemon decides it wants to run. Okay, so we did the Docker build. I, for some reason, like to re-verify things. The Docker build is running. Okay, so now we're gonna do a Docker run, and I think that's the stuff we used earlier, so that's fine. So, for those of you that are doing this yourselves, that needs to be way bigger. Can I make that bigger? Or does Notepad let me make things bigger? Do command, yes. Heading, there we go, okay, that's, wow. Um, for those of you that are here, I can't make, can, what do you say, Kim, make it? Yeah, increase the font size. Which is what, like command plus or something? Okay, okay, so for those of you that are here that are running this, and it's gonna be deleted after this, so don't think you're gonna steal my Redis database, those of you with cameras. Okay, this is the database that we're using right now. Uh, it's a live database, I'm going to delete it. At, this ends at 535, it will be deleted at 536. So I'm not saying do your worst, but do your worst. Um, please don't, I'd like to get through this. So we're gonna connect it to a Redis database that is running on DigitalOcean because when you work there, you get credits. Um, and that works out pretty nicely. So let's, where'd it go? Where'd my Docker thing go? Okay, so let's run this. Okay, so now we have a functioning one running. It's, and then how do I add a new, new tab? Okay. Plus, 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 there we go. So, we're gonna go back to, hopefully, Safari GitHub. Safari's running, and in the Python directory, we have everything running. So, okay, now we have our sample. So we have an entire sample. So we're gonna have the HT, we're gonna use HTTP, which for those of you that have never seen HTTP before, it's, it's basically just like curl, but does all the, does all the difficult parts of curl uh, post request, but much easier. So we're gonna paste this command here. Okay, and this is running on, come on. Since this is running on localhost, we're going to run it really quickly and hit enter. Now I could have changed message with a message and passphrase with your passphrase, I didn't feel like it. So we've sent it in and now it's set, set there in Redis. So now we have our key value pair in Redis, we have an ID, and what we can do is we can now take, we're gonna take that exact same one that we used, we're gonna take this ID, we're gonna copy it, We're gonna paste it, and we don't need the message part anymore. But we, just, we do need the passphrase. We hit enter, and as you see, we get our message back. So it's a working one. Um, the other thing we can do is we can do expiration. I'm not gonna spell this right, but we're gonna try it live. We'll set it to 15 seconds. Okay, so then basically what'll happen is by the time I get this copy and pasted and over there, it's gonna say, no, your, your secret has expired. So at least we know that that section has worked. Um, so our message is basically the same as it was. It's the same stuff, but by the time I get here and paste this in, because doing stuff on a trackpad does not equal speed, and we don't need the expiration time for this last one, I'm just making sure I've let 15 seconds pass. It basically says a secret has either never existed or is already used. So, the, it, so that was us seeing, we used the, the mechanism in Redis to time it out, and now the secret was automatically deleted. So from there, we go back to Safari. We go back to the, no, we go back to this, to our slides. Okay, so we've built the Docker image, and now if you have your own Docker pre-built, um, like if you have your own Docker Hub and you've already set everything up, you can do a Docker push from here. Um, Docker push and the name of it too. Like so this was, mine was called MM Egger uh, One Time Secret. So I could do a Docker push to that and it would upload it to Docker Hub and that is where my story ends. 
because now it is on Docker Hub, and now it's ready to be uh, ingested by the Kubernetes manifest whenever we deploy Kubernetes. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Kim, who's going to come up here and finish and do the Kubernetes part of the segment. I'm gonna leave my watch up here because I don't need my All watch. All right. There's my mask. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me mask. now? How about now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Give Mason a round of applause. Thanks, Mason. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so what Mason just showed us is like how do you develop an application locally? How do you uh, run it on your local machine? How do you use Docker to containerize that application, make an image of it, and then push that image up to a container registry like Docker Hub? What I'm gonna show you now is like the next part uh, that happens when you have spun up a Kubernetes cluster. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna spin up an actual cluster. Then what we're going to do is we are going to deploy the application that Mason built. Uh, and then we're gonna configure that application to be highly available. And then at the end, uh, we'll do a review and conclusion. So, um, if you go to the GitHub repository, the OSS 2022 Getting Started with Kubernetes, we're gonna be working through the readme in the Kubernetes directory. So you wanna go to that. And you have two options if you're trying to follow along with me, which I invite you to do. The first one is spin up uh, a Kubernetes cluster using DigitalOcean's managed Kubernetes. There may be some hiccups with this one. And then the second is there's this really nice option where you can use Kubernetes in the browser and it's this, at this link, it's called Killer Coda. And so once you go to Killer Coda and you log in, you actually get access to a Kubernetes cluster where your terminal is in the browser and your editor is in the browser. So this is a great way to experiment with Kubernetes the only downside of Killer Coda is there's one part of the tutorial that you can't do on that, and that's exposing the application to the internet. Um, but I would encourage you to follow along, uh, either with DigitalOcean Kubernetes or with Killer Coda. Um, so for this section, if you're using the DigitalOcean Kubernetes uh, instance, you'll need a DigitalOcean account, which I think a lot of you have installed. And then you'll also need this tool, it's called Doctal, it's the DigitalOcean command line tool. Uh, it's going to uh, get us our, our command line connected to our DigitalOcean account. So there's installation instructions at the link. You'll also need Cube Control. that's the Kubernetes command line tool. Uh, that's how you communicate with a Kubernetes cluster from your command line. And uh, if you'd like, uh, HTTP, HTTPI, um, oh, that's weird. Maybe I didn't get that right. Um, well, I can change that. Um, but that's what Mason was using to send the post request um, was HTTPI. Oh, there it is. So uh, I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes to try and get these things installed. If you're not able to get them installed and running during the live workshop, that's no problem. We've got all the instructions for how to do this in the tutorial. Uh, so you're welcome to do it uh, when you have a little bit more time. So installing Doctal, uh, Cube Control, and optionally HTTP. HTTP, they have a, they have a, they do have a pronunciation guide, but I keep going to the wrong link. <laughs> All right, so um, if you are still installing those things, no problem. I'm just gonna show you uh, what we're gonna do. So step number one is you want to create a Kubernetes cluster. You can either do that by having Killer Coda do it for you, or you create a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. So the way that you do that is you go to the DigitalOcean digital control panel. That's not the one I want. So it's at cloud.digitalocean.com. And on the left side, you're going to go to the Kubernetes tab. And you're going to create a cluster. I already have a cluster up and running in here. It was to prepare for this workshop. So I'm gonna create a new cluster. Eh, let's use this blue create cluster button. And you need to give DigitalOcean some information about what you want to be true for that cluster. 
So the first thing is you have to choose a data center region. Um, for the purposes of this exercise, I would choose a data center that's geographically closest to your location. So we're in Austin, Texas in the US right now. I think San Francisco is the closest data center. But if you're in Europe, you have the options of London, Amsterdam, and Frankfurt. If you're in Asia, Singapore, and Bangalore. So pick a data center that's close to you. And then it says select a version. Uh, this defaults to the most recent available version of Kubernetes. Um, so I would leave it as default unless you have some reason for needing a different version of Kubernetes. And then the next thing is uh, choosing the cluster capacity. So Kubernetes has a control plane and then it also has worker nodes. And so you have an opportunity to name those worker nodes. I'm just gonna name this, um, let's see, open source summit uh, node. And then you can pick your virtual machine type at DigitalOcean, we call those droplets. I'm just gonna leave it on default since this is a test cluster. Uh, well, it gives you the information about how much it's gonna cost you per month and then how many worker nodes you want up and running. Um, and then down here it says create cluster on a high availability control plane. I would do that because it's gonna spin up your cluster faster. And then it tells you how much you're gonna pay each month and then to finalize, you get to name your cluster. So I'm gonna say Open Source Summit Demo Cluster. You can pick one of these projects to put it in. I'll just leave it in Sammy Shark. And then you're, gonna kick, you're going to click Create Cluster. So what's happening now is my cluster is creating and this takes a few minutes um, to happen. Um, so the next thing that I need to do is I need to configure Doctal so that Doctal can talk with my DigitalOcean account. So first thing is I'm going to create an API token. So if you go to the API part of the DigitalOcean Cloud Console, and I'm going to create a new token. So generate new token. This is open source summit demo. You get to specify some information about that token. You want both read and write permissions. I'm gonna generate that token. You're gonna show, you're going to be shown that token once, so copy it on your clipboard. If, if you mess it up, it's no problem. You can just delete that token and create a new one, um, but you only get this once. And then uh, I'm gonna use Doctal to um, authenticate to my DigitalOcean account. Hmm. I wonder, you can't see, it doesn't, you can't see all of my terminal. That's all right, we'll figure it out. All right, so you do Doctal auth init. And yeah, it says, uh, please give me your DO token. And I've got that on my clipboard. So I pasted that and clicked enter and it said I'm validating that token. Uh, to make sure that you're actually connected to your DigitalOcean account, um, if you run doctal account get, you should see some account information. So doctal account get. I've said doctal twice, doctal account get. Beautiful, so it just says, here's your email address, here's how many VMs you get with your account, um, and are you an active uh, user of DigitalOcean? Beautiful, so I've got Doctal installed, my Doctal is connected with my DigitalOcean account, and let's go look and see if our Kubernetes cluster is up and running. So this is in the Sammy Shark project. All right, so I'm looking at my open source summit demo cluster. And we've got a progress bar up here. It looks like it's still spinning up. But uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to download uh, our kube config file. And so what that does is it allows you to use kube control to authenticate to your cluster so you can run Kubernetes commands from your command line. So the way that you do that with DigitalOcean is if you scroll down, let's see. If you go to connecting to Kubernetes, there are two ways to do this. The automated way, which is the easiest, and the manual way. So if you just grab this doctal command and you paste that in your terminal, it says, hey, I added these cluster credentials to your cube config file, um, and I set your context to that particular cluster. So back to the cluster to see if it's still spinning up, still in progress. Um, if your cluster is still spinning up, no problem. I'm gonna switch to a cluster that I already have up and running and let's take a look at that. So if I say kube control config get contexts, 
Uh, these are all of the Kubernetes clusters that I can authenticate to. I want to use my prep cluster, so I'm gonna grab that name and I'm gonna switch to that. So cube control config use context. And it says, hey, I switched to that cluster that you've already used. Um, and so once your Kubernetes cluster is already spun up, you wanna verify that you can actually connect. And the way I like to do that is I just say kube control, that's the Kubernetes command line tool, get uh, nodes. <laughs> ah, we got a yay. <laughs> and so this is what you should see. I have a list of those three worker nodes. Um, and uh, you can tell I, I spun this up two days ago. It tells you the name of the nodes, whether or not they're ready, and then the version of Kubernetes that they're running. We're running Kubernetes version 1.22.8. So we just did a ton of things there. I created a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. I used Doctal to download the Kubernetes config file. And then I used kube control to make sure that I can connect to my cluster. If you're following along with Killer Coda, go to tab one, and I'll make this bigger, and you can do the exact same thing. You can say kube control get nodes, and you can see, okay, that's a little better. You can see I have a control plane node and one called node 01, so I can connect to this Kubernetes cluster as well. All right, so let's, Beautiful, take a look. All right, so we've got our Kubernetes cluster up and running, and the next thing is we want to deploy uh, Mason's one-time secret application into the Kubernetes cluster. And so this is the Docker Hub, and this is Mason's account on Docker Hub, and this is the one-time secret image that he built on his computer and pushed to this container registry. So if I go to tags, um, it tells me the Docker command to pull down this image, um, but what I really want is uh, the name of his uh, Docker Hub account and then the name of the application, and then uh, it looks like the tag has the date on it. So um, we're gonna have a quiz in a few minutes. So in Kubernetes, um, you want things to be highly available, and one way you can do that is have multiple replicas of your application running. So instead of having just one of the one-time secret app running in the Kubernetes cluster, we wanna have three. And here's how you do that in Kubernetes. Actually, let's do it up here. So if you go into the manifest file, these are all YAML files that um, are going to create Kubernetes resources. And a deployment is the way that you want to set up more than one replica of an application running. So if you take a look at this, uh, this is my deployment. You see the kind here. And I've got some other information. I'm saying, hey, I want three replicas. If you just wanted one replica, you would put that number there. If you wanted 10 replicas running, you'd put that there. And then this on line 21 is really important. This is the image that we're pulling down. This is Mason's image. Um, if you push your container image to the Docker Hub, you would change it to uh, the address for your image. So I've got Mason's there, and I have the latest tag, which is 22620. Uh, and then I've got all those environment variables that we saw in the Docker file in here. This is a terrible practice to have your password up in your GitHub repo, um, but I want you to have the opportunity to run this application and see it work. So, all right, so I've got that deployment, and we want to put that in our Kubernetes cluster, uh, but what we wanna do next is we wanna create a namespace. So if I go to my command line, if I say kube control, get ns, that stands for namespaces, so these four namespaces come by default with Kubernetes. One is called default, and then we have kube node lease, kube public, and kube system. In general, you want to create a different namespace for the applications that you're running. And so we're gonna create a namespace where we're going to put the one-time secret application, and I wanna call it app namespace. So I've got a manifest for that. It's called namespace YAML, and uh, you've, 
probably heard of infrastructure as code, and uh, one of the things that has to be true is you have to be able to store your configuration uh, in files that can be saved and managed with Git. Well, this is how, one way you can do that in Kubernetes is through YAML. So instead of typing kube control create namespace, I'm gonna say, hey, Kubernetes, will you create whatever resource is defined in that file, which is called uh, namespace YAML? So here's how that works. You say kube control apply, and then let me see if I get the directory path right. So Kubernetes, no, oh, it doesn't look like it. Where am I, am I? No, I'm in the right spot, okay. So I'm gonna say kube control apply the file called Kubernetes, and it's in the manifest directory, and it's called namespace.yaml. And Kubernetes says, hey, I created that app namespace. You can verify that by running kube control get namespaces, and you see I've got my app namespace there, uh, but there's nothing in there. Uh, so let's put three replicas of the one-time secret app in there. So we already looked at the deployment.yaml. That's where we're going to create, they're called pods, three Kubernetes pods inside uh, the app namespace, and I have the namespace specified here. So I'm going to run a similar command, kube control apply the file in the manifest directory called deployment. And Kubernetes says, I created that deployment and I wanna check, do I have three replicas running? And the way I do that is I say kube control, get me all the pods in the namespace called app namespace. Yeah, you see I've got three different pods running. They're all one-time secret pods, but they all have different unique IDs at the end, and they're running, so that is good to go. Um, and so this is actually, Kubernetes has grabbed the image from Mason's uh, Docker Hub, and it has created those containers inside the Kubernetes cluster. So we're getting closer, uh, but you might ask, like, how can you check that, uh, that these are working? And so right now these pods or these uh, replicas of the application are only available in the Kubernetes cluster. And so we have to do something in the Kubernetes cluster to uh, test the application. And so the way that we're gonna do that is I have another YAML file, it's called utilities. And so this is also a deployment. This deployment is only going to spin up one replica and uh, Utilities is a project that a friend of mine, Andy Suderman, built. It's a container that has a lot of tools that are helpful for us, like curl, wget, things like that, so you can test inside your Kubernetes cluster. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin up this new container called Utilities, then we're going to install uh, HTTP, uh, the project, and then we're going to make those post requests inside the Kubernetes cluster. So here's how that works. First thing I'm gonna do, kube control apply the file in Kubernetes manifest called utilities. And that should be in the um, app namespace. So kube control get pods from the namespace app namespace. All right, so I've got my utilities pod here. And the next thing I'm gonna do, which I think is the coolest thing you can do in Kubernetes, I think some other people might disagree, I'm actually going to exec into that pod. And so I'm gonna run a command that's going to open up a shell inside that pod so I can run commands inside that pod. And uh, all this is in the tutorial, so, uh, well, let's actually look at it. <laughs> all right, so exec, there we go. So we're going to exec into the pod. So it's this command, you say kube control exec, give me an interactive terminal. You have to paste in the specific name of your utilities pod, which is gonna be different than mine. It needs to happen in the app namespace, um, namespace, and then you're gonna say, hey, drop me into a shell where I can run commands. So, um, let's see, kube control exec it, Oh, that's way too much, but that's okay. I copied the whole line, not just the name. In the namespace app namespace. And then I'm gonna say bin shell. Okay, so you see my uh, command line prompt has changed. It's changed from the 
ZSH uh, theme that I have with the green arrow, and now I just have this hash, hash sign. And so if you list what's in here, I'm inside that utilities container, and I have all of these things that have already been installed, but I want to install uh, HTTP. And the way I'm gonna do that is run this extremely long command, um, and this will take a couple of minutes because it's actually installing HTTP in this particular container, and so we'll let that happen. But once that's installed, um, I wanna make a post request to one of those pods. And so let me open a new tab. In order to make a post request, so when Mason did it, he was saying localhost and then the port was 8080. And so I'm not gonna use localhost because this pod, these containers are in my Kubernetes cluster. So I need to get the IP address of my pods. And so that the way that you do that is you say cube control get pods from the namespace app namespace. And you say, uh, give me the output in the wide format. So it's gonna give you more information than normal. All right, so I have my three one-time secret containers, and I have my utilities container, and I have the IP addresses um, of those containers. So if you're familiar with IP addresses, anything that starts with 10 is a private IP address, so it's only available in the Kubernetes cluster, which is why we had to spin up that container inside of the cluster. And so I'm gonna grab, uh, I'm gonna grab one of these IP addresses um, because I'm gonna need that for the post request. All right. So it looks like HTTP got installed in this container. If I run HTTP, I should see the command menu. Beautiful. All right, so if you scroll down, this test write should look familiar. This is pulled directly from the Docker uh, tutorial. So I'm gonna say HTTP post. I'm gonna replace this with the IP address I just found, need port 8080 uh, to the secrets endpoint. And then I'm gonna say, uh, message, your message, and the passphrase. So uh, let's do that. So HTTP post, and then the IP address, port 8080 secrets, and it's message equals hi, uh, we'll say OSS, and then the passphrase. I do like the passphrase cheese, so we'll do that. <laughs> Hey, this is awesome. So I sent that post request from a different container to one of those pods and it said, hey, I created that one-time secret for you. So we can run the other command, which is to uh, pass the ID. So HTTP, oh, I think I, eh, HTTP post. Oh, this is always a mess. Um, all right, IP address, port, secrets, and then the ID. And then I also have to give it the passphrase. Passphrase equals cheese. I do need post again. Thank you. I'm going to cancel that. Um, so we'll do HTTP post, and then we'll paste all that. Show me that JSON. Hey! So, yeah, this is cool. So I have this application deployed in my Kubernetes cluster. I can access and like make post requests to the application from inside the Kubernetes cluster. But the more interesting part is you want this to be available to you on the internet. And so the way that you do that in Kubernetes is something called a Kubernetes service. So this is a nice diagram that shows three of the Kubernetes service types. This is on the quiz at the end, so pay attention. So one service type is cluster IP. It's just when you need things in your Kubernetes cluster to communicate with one another internally, so you don't need it out on the internet. Node port is when you actually open a specific port on a specific VM, and uh, that sort of defeats the purpose of Kubernetes because you want your uh, VMs to be able to go down or be upgraded and go away, and so the port's going to be changing, so you want that to be dynamic. But load balancer, this is the good one. What the load balancer service does is whatever cloud provider you're using, DigitalOcean, AWS, GCP, it spins up a load balancer from your cloud provider and gives you an external endpoint uh, that allows traffic from the internet to come into your Kubernetes cluster. And so let's create a Kubernetes service. Um, guess what, it's, it's in the manifest. So let's take a look at the service manifest. All right, so we go to service.yaml, 
pretty simple. Actually, I hate when people say that. I think Kubernetes is hard. Uh, not that many lines of YAML. <laughs> so this is a service. I'm naming it OTS service, one-time secret service. I'm asking this service to be created in the app namespace. If I put it in another namespace, it wouldn't work. Um, this is important. I'm saying to the service, so the service gets a stable IP address, and then the service load balances to those three containers that we created. The way that the service knows which containers to talk to is this particular set of lines, the selector and the app. And the name of my app in the deployment is OTS, and I'm saying, hey, the app, that's where you want to send traffic to. And then uh, target port, like Mason had, localhost 8080. I had that IP address 8080. We're going to use the 8080 port and then type load balancer. So I'm going to create this service. I'm going to exit out of my utilities pod. See my command line uh, terminal prompt has changed. And so kube control, apply the file in Kubernetes manifests, the one called service. <laughs> And services um, take a few minutes to spin up and give you that external IP. But let's see what we've got so far. So I'm going to say, hey, Kubernetes, uh, let's see, kube control, get the SVC for services. Uh, dash capital A means all namespaces. All right, so if you see, um, I have the app namespace, the OTS service. Oh, you can't see it. It's too big. <laughs> All right, so if you see uh, the app namespace, the OTS service, uh, there's the cluster IP, so that's the private IP in the Kubernetes cluster, and then external IP is pending. So DigitalOcean is actually creating me a load balancer, and it's going to give me an IP address. Let's look back at our DigitalOcean account and, and see that. So if I go to my networking tab, and if I go to load balancers, um, it's still creating, but this is the load balancer that I just spun up by applying that service. Um, so, oh, it's so close, look at it. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> and so what I wanna show you is, um, I wanna show you, and you can do it on your computer too, but I wanna make that post request, um, not from inside the Kubernetes cluster, but from my local machine, and get those kinds of responses back from the one-time secret app. So if this progress bar is correct, we're really, really close. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> and we'll just run this command again and see if we have an external IP. Not yet. Not yet. OK. This says, I'm awesome. OK, it's actually giving me the IP address 146, 190, 14, 13. Let's see. All right, I think that's gonna be the IP address of this. We'll give it just a minute. All right, well, nonetheless, um, let's grab this IP address. And so uh, my command prompt is my computer, so I'm not in my Kubernetes cluster right now, but I do have HTTP installed, so there's proof of that. So uh, let's, let's make a request. So HTTP post, and then I'm gonna give the IP address because in the service I told you the target port, I specified that, I don't have to have 8080. So secrets, and then uh, we've got message um, the, to the internet. <laughs> and then the passphrase is gonna be Gouda. <laughs> oh no, I missed, a, I missed something. What did I miss? Oh, thank you. The exclamation point is, all right, to the, oh, yeah. All right, so this is from my computer. I made this request to that IP address, and it worked. I got this ID, and to prove it, I'm going to make a post request. I'm going to take out the message, and I need to uh, add the uh, unique ID to that post request and the passphrase. Oh, that didn't work. Maybe I did something wrong. Hey! Actually, it did work because now it said that secret's already been read. So um, that means we got that service on the internet. Let's see if that service um, 
if the IP address gets listed. So before it said pending, now the external IP has this IP address. And the next step in your Kubernetes journey is you would set up something called an ingress controller where you could have a domain name like uh, ossconferencesgreat.com and then you could have uh, that domain name point to this particular IP address. So that would be the next step. Okay, that was a total whirlwind. Um, <laughs> but let's just review what we've done. So you created an app with Mason. You uh, made an image. You pushed that image to a container registry. Docker Hub is one. Uh, there's other ones. Quay, uh, DigitalOcean as a container registry. Then we spun up a DigitalOcean account. And uh, we created a Kubernetes cluster. And then we deployed, hey, we got it. We deployed three replicas of the one-time secret app to that Kubernetes cluster. We made sure that the app was working internally in the cluster, and then we exposed the application via a load balancer service so that internet traffic could meet that. And this is the very end. <laughs> so if you would like to play, we have three prizes. Um, so this is actually a quiz. There's only five questions. So what you can do on your phone or your laptop, and if you're watching online, please do this as well. Go to kahoot.it and then enter the game pin 640-5489. And uh, we have a quiz uh, about what we just covered. And we'll have a leaderboard. We've got a third place prize, a second place prize, and the first place prize is this wonderful Sammy plush. All right, beautiful. We've already got two people. Love it. Um, if you go to kahoot.it, it'll ask you for a game pin. It'll look like, oh, I should, I should, I should not not show you the game pin. Oh, thank you, whoever Kim Rocks is. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Also, I am hungry. <laughs> whoever is hungry. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Cheese. <laughs> okay, we're having really good participation on this particular quiz. All right, looks like we're about ready to start. Um, all right, you can still join, but let's get started. So this is the Open Source Summit, getting started with Kubernetes Workshop Quiz. All right, so this is from Mason's portion. What is the Dockerfile directive for declaring an environment variable? So in your Dockerfile, how do you declare an environment variable? Is it arg? <laughs> is it env? <laughs> Someone's chuckling. Is it var? Or is it env underscore var? Wow, good job, everybody. The correct answer is env. Uh, 17 people got it right. Uh, looks like nine people got it wrong. And so you may be wondering um, how, oh, I haven't shown you this yet. All right, so this is the leaderboard. So we've got Joe in first place, Chuckles in second place, Blub in third place. And so with Kahoot, the accuracy of the response is important. You have to get the answer right, but speed is also important. So Joe must have gone the fastest, uh, which is why he's at the top. So you wanna be correct and you wanna be fast uh, to get on the leaderboard. So let's go on to the next question, true or false? This is the command to push an image to the Docker registry. True or false? Docker push the name of your image and then the tag. True or false? This is the command to push an image to the Docker registry. Docker push name colon and then the tag. All right, that was true. All right, the leaderboard. Joe's still in first, Damien moved up into second, and Chuckles has moved to third. All right, good job, Scheuer is the highest climber. Next question, into the Kubernetes. Which Kubernetes resource allows you to declare the number of pod replicas? So which of those manifests, where, where did I de declare the number of pod replicas? Was it a Kubernetes deployment, a load balancer, a service or a stateful set? Which Kubernetes resource allows you to declare the number of pod replicas? <laughs> All 
All right, excellent, most of you got it. It is a deployment. Um, so that was the thing we created that spun up three replicas of the one-time secret app, a deployment. And that's uh, part of the highly available part of Kubernetes. All right, Damien has moved into first, Scheuer into second, and Hoho into third. <laughs> All right, two more questions. Which type of load balancer exposes an application to the internet? So that was the, the image I showed you. Which type of load balancer exposes an application to the internet? Is it a uh, load balancer, a node port, a cluster IP, or an external name? This question is worded incorrectly, that's my bad. It's which type of service exposes an application to the internet, uh, but yes, it's, it's load balancer. Well, that one was close. So the second most voted was cluster IP. That's just for communicating workloads inside of Kubernetes. So load balancer is the one where you get a, a nice IP address from your cloud provider. All right, Hoho has moved into first. Maz into second and Damien into third. One final question. Ah, when connecting a service with a pod, which label must match? So when connecting a service with a pod, which label must match? Is it the name label or the app label? The name label or the app label? Ooh, it is the app label. All right, so leaderboard. So in third place, you get a charger from DigitalOcean is Chuckles. If you're in the room, you can come grab this after. In second place is Moz, a DigitalOcean water bottle. And in first place, Ho-Ho, you've earned this Sammy plushie. Thanks so much for coming, y'all. <laughs> Give Mason another round of applause. <laughs> We've got some stickers in the back. Come see our DigitalOcean booth if you'd like some more swag or to chat. And then Mason and I will be here um, for a little bit if you have questions. Thanks so much.